and then we'll get uh, off here. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this ADEC uh, webinar. Uh, we have uh, Cindy Hart with us from West Virginia University and uh, this webinar focuses on uh, quality does matter uh, and we want to share uh, with you some of the experiences that we have uh, had at adopting and implementing quality standards uh, both in online and in blended courses. Uh, now in regards to some of the institutions that or the organizations that are working on quality standards and implementation <laughs> probably best known as Quality Matters uh, in the United States, uh, but we have also seen uh, various um, adaptations of quality standards by each institution individually, and we're going to talk about that a little bit in the next hour. So if you have any questions while Cindy uh, and I are talking, uh, please just uh, use the chat function, uh, and we will have, I think, plenty of time also uh, to um, have a little bit of a discussion among ourselves about quality uh, in the online and blended uh, classroom. So, Cindy, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Oliver. It's a pleasure uh, and uh, we've been working on various issues together. We both on the executive committee for ADEC and uh, Cindy is uh, kind of the go-to person when it comes to quality uh, in uh, both the online and the blended classroom, from what I understand. Uh, can you explain a little bit your role at West Virginia University, Cindy? I'm director of WVU Online Programs. I've been involved in distance learning for 26 years. Um, so I oversee all of our online programs, and then I've undertaken the Quality Matters initiative here. Our state adopted Quality Matters in 2012. Um, all of our new courses have to be developed to meet Quality Matters standards, and now we're going back to work on all of our um, courses that were previous developed um, to incorporate Quality Matters standards. That is quite an undertaking, uh, I would assume, because uh, you're, you have got a very wide offering of, of courses online, right? Correct. We have um, over 500 online courses. <laughs> and how many how many courses have you been able to uh, meet quality matters standards uh, right now? We just started the review process last year. Um, Forty six courses have passed review. Um, we have thirty two faculty that we're working with right now um, whose courses didn't pass, but we're working to uh, get standards. Um, Okay. Uh, as the quality matters standards, and then we have 18 more courses ready to go through the review process. <laughs> wow. So as you can see, we have a long way to go. <laughs> wow, uh, that's, yeah, uh, if you consider like 500 courses, I don't know what, uh, uh, for us at the University of Florida, uh, with uh, UF Online just started about a year ago, um, how many courses we currently have, uh, but we haven't started any quality matters uh, review yet. We have our own standards. Uh, so, uh, what, we wanna, uh, what we want to talk a, lot, a little bit about uh, today is uh, what are standards of quality in general and how do we classify uh, the different areas. So, each institution might have a different uh, classification of their standards and uh, what particular areas they want to address or see as critical to address. Um, what's particularly an interesting is to consider content versus delivery. And uh, now when we talk about quality matters, uh, it is really the format of the course and how it is delivered that is mainly focused on, whereas you have a subject matter expert or a content expert uh, that addresses concerns regarding uh, the content, basically the professional content. So these two areas kind of, uh, of how to evaluate the quality of a course are kind of separate from each other. and. Um, here at the University of Florida and I think uh, at West Virginia University it's the same way that you kind of separate them out and the content is really uh, basically the subject matter expert, uh, the course instructor uh, or the course representative um, that kind of determines the content uh, based on specific guidelines uh, that may be prescribed by uh, their college or their department. Um, and then the delivery part is really where 
uh, the instructional designer is where uh, the quality comes into play that is currently being evaluated on a larger scale. So these are two areas that need to be separated during a, a course review. Um, and what is really important or what is currently being focused on mainly is the delivery, uh, the course format and different aspects that play to the quality of the delivery of a course. So uh, important here is uh, also to setting a framework for success. And as Cindy already pointed out, uh, what is done in West Virginia is also done in a similar manner at other institutions uh, across the US and uh, on a global level as well. Uh, to really uh, approach a course uh, from uh, a success point of view in terms of making incremental mm -hmm. changes. So you're not necessarily looking at a course uh, from just a, a, uh, a point in time, but really how a course that has already been <coughs> delivered or that is going to be delivered uh, is being designed for success. And success in this case means uh, the benefit of uh, the course to both the course instructor and the students. Um, and, and therefore, it's important to get the buy-in from faculty, and we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later. Quality, uh, as, I, as I pointed out, is a continuous process, so you really have a cycle of course review and continuous improvements. There is no static course delivery that once you have your course basically approved according to the standards, that is how it's going to be um, uh, from there on out and you don't really have to uh, concern yourself any longer with that. There's always room for improvement and as faculties uh, evolve in their role in, in becoming more knowledgeable with the online environment, they might be able to further improve their own course uh, beyond the expectations, the minimum expectations that the course has to meet by the institution or by Quality Matters or some other organization. Uh, what we can definitely distinguish between is uh, the individual reviews, so uh, basically the course instructor and potentially an instructional designer that exists uh, <laughs> a system in setting up the course uh, that would be on the individual level uh, where they just review the course in terms of uh, content and especially the delivery format, how is the course organized. Uh, then we have the peer review, and that is probably what, what happens at most institutions. It's kind of an internal review where uh, other colleagues from different departments or within the same college or even from other colleges look at the course and how it is set up and how it is delivered. Uh, so both the individual and the peer review can consider both content and delivery. Uh, but uh, when it comes to external review, especially when we talk about quality matters, that's where it really mainly focuses on the quality of the format and the delivery of the course materials and not so much on the content itself. Although obviously the content uh, kind of ties into that. How well do you construct and how well do you format the content in order to be delivered? Uh, when we look at uh, the development cycle, uh, this has been taken from a website. Um, basically, uh, you design your course as the course instructor together with an instructional designer. Um, and there you can already, as uh, Cindy pointed out, uh, with new courses, you can uh, directly set standards or best practices. Um, and then you, you basically test uh, this course uh, via peer review and potentially a student that tests it before it actually is being delivered. Uh, when you deliver the course, uh, especially uh, induction uh, link to face-to-face, -to -face, so there are some things that need to be considered when you deliver the course uh, that are different from a face-to-face -face environment. Uh, support and sustain student activity, especially sustaining student activity throughout the semester is important. Uh, you might have a spike in student activity at the beginning of the semester when you do introductions and the like, but sustaining that activity throughout the semester through interactive discussions, through a virtual office hours, uh, through mandatory postings to discussion boards can greatly improve the delivery and the overall perception of keeping students engaged with the course uh, during delivery. And then after the course has been delivered, uh, usually over the course of a semester or over eight weeks, it depends a little bit um, uh, on the institution, 
And then you evaluate the student learning experience. And the learning experience has to in incorporate uh, an alignment between uh, the student, uh, the learning outcomes uh, that you design into the course and uh, the assessments. So that is important, uh, that there is a link between the learning outcomes that uh, usually can follow Bloom's taxonomy or something alike, and uh, the assessments that are being utilized in the course. Uh, so that's where some of the learner analytics come into play and big data can come into play, especially with larger courses uh, where you reflect on these um, on these evaluations and how well the learning outcomes tie to assessments and how well assessments reflect learning outcomes. Uh, and then uh, the, the formal course review uh, might take a place where you identify uh, lessons that you learned, uh, you reflect upon uh, you yourself as the course instructor, what went well, what didn't go well, and then uh, based on these uh, successes or uh, challenges that you were facing, you inform basically the the uh, the, the further course design, uh, what tasks need to be uh, addressed in order to um, move the design forward, to improve the design, um, the role of the instructor, how much involvement should each instructor, if it's for example a team taught course, play. And then um, you kind of go to the reflection stage that kind of ties together with the design stage. Um, pedagogic aims for online activity, so there are now a number of different uh, publications and books that address uh, these issues. What kind of design models or what kind of uh, instructional design models do you want to use that can be easily adopted uh, with uh, the learning management system that you have, with the various tools that you have available at your institution. And then it's also important to match not only assessments but also uh, tools that are at your disposal with the learning objectives and the learning outcomes. And that basically is a cycle. So uh, uh, usually uh, each time a course is offered um, you want to kind of go through this cycle. You want to evaluate what went well, what didn't go well, then sit down with the instructional designer, really go step by step through the course review, uh, and then reflect on it. How well does it fit with the model that I want to overall use to engage learners and uh, to meet the learning outcomes and the objectives? Uh, Cindy, do you have anything to add to this? No, I don't. You've done a great job. Okay, um, so I just want to make sure that I'm not just uh, being on LSD here or anything like that. So um, uh, the way it's done at the University of Florida is currently that we have what's called um, the Standards and Markers of Excellence. Uh, so uh, that is a, a UF-wide initiative that is not necessarily only specifically addressed towards online courses, but also towards any component of a course that is online. So what uh, obviously is being increasingly utilized are the learning management systems. And uh, at UF we switched uh, from Blackboard to Sakai and now we are on Canvas. And almost every course has some kind of online um, involvement, some, some kind of online component. Uh, may it be the syllabus, may it be a discussion board, may it be a great uh, book or anything like that. And the way this has been determined or broken down are these eight, I think these are eight different uh, broad areas uh, that should be addressed uh, in terms of quality of the format of the course. Uh, so one important uh, part here is course introduction and overview. Uh, and this is especially important uh, in familiarizing students with the online learning environment. So. Uh, information needs to be readily accessible. It needs to be clearly stated where they, uh, where students can find what kind of information. Uh, the overview often is in the form of a syllabus. Uh, now with the capabilities that we have, we can easily use uh, web cameras or like to introduce ourselves, record a brief in introduction as the in, uh, instructor uh, to connect with students. Um, important policies should be addressed in the, in the syllabus and the like. So this is kind of uh, a general expectations, uh, syllabus, and introduction uh, that connects with students 
and engages them right from the start, but especially in regards to meeting expectations in the course. So when do students have to be online? Uh, what about deadlines? All of these things should be addressed in there um, uh, in, in this course introduction and overview. Um, it must be easily accessible. That's kind of um, tying to it. It needs to be easily, <coughs> excuse me, found within uh, the course navigation. The second area are the course goals and objectives. And objectives here um, are both course object, course level objectives and also um, module or unit level objectives. Uh, so there are the, the greater objectives uh, that you want students to take with them uh, when they complete the course. So at the completion of this course, students should be able to, or like where the student should be able to, or you should be able to um, meet these and these uh, requirements. Um, and, and then use uh, Bloom's taxonomy to really use active verbs to describe what they should get out of it. Um, goals and objectives are kind of the same in this case. Uh, sometimes if it's a continuing education course, it might not be directly an objective, but more like a goal uh, that you want somebody to get out of it. And then it's broken further down into the learning objectives for each of the units or modules. And that's where assessment and measurement uh, as another area is very important. As I mentioned before, the learning objectives should be tied uh, to assessments. So whatever the learning outcomes you want the student to get, from a particular unit, a particular module, it should be accessible. Uh, so there needs to be some kind of assessment uh, that evaluates uh, these learning objectives. This can be in the form of a multiple choice quiz, in the form of uh, an essay assignment, in the form of a discussion board uh, post, in the form of a reflection on a particular case. Uh, sometimes it might be an extension of what has been learned in in the um, in in that particular module. Uh, so it can be take various forms, but it needs to be um, objectively measurable. Uh, that's that's important. Uh, so it, it needs to be standardized to uh, to meet basically um, every student. So every student can be assessed fairly and objectively. Uh, so these three areas are kind of core areas that you want to see reflected uh, in every online course. Um, when it comes to instructional materials, um, like I said, the content is not so much focused on when we look at quality in terms of formatting and delivery, but more how is the instructional material set up? How easy is it for students to access it? How easy is it for students uh, to, um, for example, listen to a video and also have it transcribed or like. So it needs to be accessible for all kind of learners, uh, kind of. Um, um, so this is more what, what is being focused on when we talk about quality of instructional materials, not so much um, the actual uh, subject matter uh, content, but more how is the instructional material delivered. When it comes to interaction and engagement as another area, um, this is kind of essential to keeping students engaged and interested. Uh, so this is where the uh, instructor might be able uh, to play a significant role uh, in terms of uh, keeping students engaged uh, between the different units. The discussion board postings uh, or hosting um, virtual office hours, something like that. Uh, or having particular assessments that particularly uh, focus on team assignments or like that engage students uh, with the course throughout the course. Uh, course technology is another important area. Uh, so uh, obviously you need to be able to access the course uh, no matter what device you're using. Now we're going more uh, on mobile devices, on tablets and the like. Uh, is uh, the learning management system set up to be accessible through some of these um, uh, these different uh, technologies that we're using. But also if you consider particular technologies that are being utilized, uh, how well can students uh, utilize these technologies? How easy is it for students uh, to uh, utilize the technologies? Do the technologies make sense in regards to meeting the learning objectives? Does it make sense to use these learning these course technologies in order to meet the learning objectives? 
accessibility is becoming uh, an increasing issue, especially for uh, students that have a disability. Um, so here, for example, transcripts of uh, videos of narrated PowerPoint slides or like should be made available. Uh, also accessibility to other resources like um, an online library resource or even uh, something like uh, student uh, support services. And then course design evaluation, this is kind of an overall um, uh, category uh, for how consistent is the course design throughout. So is it really broken down into units that make sense? Uh, is, it, um, is it consistent uh, throughout that, you know, you have like a breadcrumb trail, for example, to go back from a, a particular site to the home page? Uh, it kind of ties some of the other components together in an overall fashion. So this is how we currently do it uh, for the standards at the University of Florida. Each of these is broken down into particular um, sub uh, measures uh, that um, kind of guide uh, in the design of the course um, and also obviously are used for peer review within the University of Florida. <clears throat> uh, Cindy, um, do you want to talk a little bit about the quality matters standards or should I take care of this? Um, either way, if you want me to do it, I'm prepared. If you don't mind, that would be great. Okay. Before, going, before going forward, I have a question here. Sure, go okay. ahead. Yeah, any, any connection between the instructional materials and uh, the accessibility? Um, yes, so uh, obviously depending on where you set up your instructional materials, if you set up your instructional materials within uh, the learning management system, then it needs to be accessible through that. If you use, for example, a PDF format for some of your instructional materials, uh, reading assignments or like if you have articles or something that you created yourself, then you need to make sure that students can access these PDFs that they know that they need uh, Adobe Acrobat Reader or something like that. But also mm -hmm. instructional materials in regards to if you give a lecture, a two-hour lecture, and you put the video up there, then you should transcribe that lecture so that students who have a hearing impairment, for example, are still able to follow along. So you would need to trans transcribe it at that point. Good. Does that make sense? Thank you. Um, there would be, need to be a transcript whether you have a video or just an audio file um, to accommodate the learning um, disabilities. Uh, so either way, whether it's an audio file or a video, a text transcript. And Oliver spoke to the PDF. There is a certain way to save a PDF in accessible format. Um, so it's okay. important to know that. Or if you're saving a PowerPoint file, it needs to be saved in an accessible format. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, resources out on the web. If you Google accessibility, it'll tell you how to save those. And then okay. something to keep in mind that we've encountered a lot, um, Flash um, interactivity activities for engagement. Um, Flash is being phased out. Um, everything's moving to HTML5. So if courses have Flash, um, individuals with disabilities will not be able to access those. So it would need to be a uh, text transcript of what that activity is as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure thing. Um, Cindy, let me go ahead and um, yes, I, I move forward to the next slide. <laughs> okay. Um, a lot of the items that Oliver discussed actually fall right in place with Quality Matters. Uh, the Quality Matters rubric, rubric is eight um, overall standards where they're listed on this PowerPoint and then there's 43 individual standards. I'm not going to go over every one of those, but I do encourage you to go to the URL at the bottom of the page and download the uh, Quality Matters rubric, and that way you can see every individual standard. Uh, a couple areas that Oliver didn't touch on um, that fall with Quality Matters, learning objectives. Um, with Quality Matters, you're required to provide learning objectives for each module and unit, not only course, but it has to be included in your module or your unit. Um, another key area for uh, Quality Matters is that navigation is intuitive. It needs to be easy to navigate because keep in mind that uh, Quality Matters is about course design. 
Um, so those are two areas that Oliver uh, didn't touch on um, that are critical. Um, the assessment and measurement, um, something to think about is the alignment. He briefly touched on it, but that's a key component of Quality Matters. Your course level objectives, your module level objectives, and your assignments or assessments have to align. An example would be if your module level objective is discuss X and then your assessment is a multiple choice, that won't align because if it's a multiple choice exam, you can't discuss. Uh, so that's one of the areas that uh, I see with Quality Matters that uh, a lot of course, a lot of faculty have encountered problems. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm not going to go over every 43 individual standards. I'm just touching on the, the critical ones that Oliver didn't talk a little bit about. Engagement, course activities, and learner interaction. It's critical in order to pass Quality Matters. Um, some of the courses don't have discussions, but they will pass if they have group assignments. There has to be the learner-to-learner -learner interaction. When we talk about the instructional materials, um, all courses, all online courses, uh, really whatever standards you're using, it doesn't have to be Quality Matters, you should have um, student-to-content interaction, student-to-instructor uh, interaction, and student-to-student -student interaction in order to meet that standard. Just a second, I'm just going down through my list here. Another area that Oliver touched on that I'll uh, go a little bit deeper is uh, the course technology. Don't use all the bells and whistles if they're not needed. A lot of faculty think, oh, I'm going to put every single um, bell and whistle, I'm going to use wikis, I'm going to use blogs, I'm going to use uh, discussions, anything and everything they can think of. But it really doesn't serve the purpose. So it's critical to think about your technology and make sure you're using the technology to serve a purpose, not just to add it. Uh, learner support services, uh, there's quite a few things that, uh, there's four standards there. And really it is uh, all resources available to students so that they're successful. It's uh, technical support for your learning management system or if students can't access it, they need help with their computers, things of that nature. Um, accessibility services, there should be a link in your course to uh, fit that learner support module. Like I said, any academic support services, uh, but there are four individual standards. It's pretty easy to meet that as long as you put the link to your resources, college resources in there. And then we've talked a lot about the accessibility. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind with the accessibility and usability is that your course really needs to um, navigation facilitates ease of use. It shouldn't be folders all over the place. There needs to be a nice structure. And then a couple things we didn't touch on uh, for accessibility is think about a colorblind student. If you use a lot of red font in your uh, course, that's one of the top colors that colorblind individuals cannot see. So don't um, use a bunch of different fonts, colors, things of that nature. Keep it standard so that it will be easy to navigate, uh, readability, um, things of that nature. Um, but again, I encourage you to go to the URL at the bottom, qualitymatters.org. They have a wonderful rubric. It gives all 43 individual standards. Uh, it gives the point value. Anything on that um, rubric with a three point, it has to meet that in order to pass the um, Quality Matters review. All courses have to come out with an 85% uh, in order to pass. Any questions about the rubric? I know it went over it fast, but I don't want to take your time to go over 43 individual um, <laughs> standards. It is clear. It's good. OK. So Quality Matters also offers a number of uh, training sessions themselves on uh, these rubrics, uh, on the Quality Matter rubrics. And I found it very interesting. I just took it recently. Um, and I think it was really eye-opening for me to see how it can benefit me as the instructor to follow these rubrics right from the beginning when I design a course. Because going back and um, kind of building, kind of rebuilding the course uh, after you have taught it uh, is, is, is quite a feat to accomplish. So I definitely understand, Cindy, that you 
uh, moving forward want, want everybody to, to use the quality matter standards or rubrics um, as you have adopted it. Correct. Um, something else that's available on the website, I, I don't know if you have this, Oliver, but it's a Quality Matters Higher Education Rubric Workbook, and it goes through all eight standards and then all 43 individual standards, and it gives great pointers of what should be included in all of those standards, but it's a fantastic workbook, and I think it's like $15, something like that, that I've referenced mine frequently, and all of our faculty um, who have went through training here on campus I've given them that workbook, and I've heard a lot of um, comments about how, uh, how it has helped them to be successful in incorporating quality matters into their course. Oh, great. Yeah, I, didn't, I heard about the, the workbook when, uh, when I took the, um, the initial course of, that introduced the quality matter rubrics, but I, uh, I haven't bought it. So thanks for letting me know. Uh, so that's something. I don't I know. Will Oliver, I'll send you a workbook. I have quite a few extras here, and uh, it would be very helpful for you. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's great. Um, okay. I think um, the next slide is also yours, Cindy, uh, about yeah. the implementation of quality at uh, West Virginia. Again, you don't necessarily have to use Quality Matters. You can have any... Um, best practices, standardized document, uh, but you need to have something in place for um, faculty to follow when developing online courses. Again, we adopted Quality Matters, but here are some ways that we um, implemented quality in online courses. Uh, one thing we found early on after we adopted uh, Quality Matters, it's really important to leverage um, your university, college, uh, faculty support at all stages. Uh, we, at the very beginning, we thought we're just going to push this out. We're not going to get buy-in. Well, since we started talking about it, we received a lot of pushback. So that's when we started going out. We started talking to all of our um, administrators here on campus and then uh, got a couple early adopters um, to join us. So one of the early adopters was special education, the others was business. So after they started working with us, um, they went back and started talking. And that's how we got college buy-in. Um, got faculty buy-in. We offered some incentives, some stipends um, for our very first adopters. So, and it doesn't always have to relate to money. Um, it can be if you assign an instructional designer to that faculty member to help them. Uh, we've had several that was uh, more interested in having support than a financial incentive. But utilize all of your, your resources across campus and get buy-in. Um, we've uh, created a framework and set expectations for the courses through a Quality Matters template. Uh, with that template, we incorporate all the policies. Um, it, the course overview introduction, um, almost all of that was developed into the, uh, the template. All of policies are in there. This really helped faculty. They didn't have to worry about um, the little things. They, they don't really know all the WVU policies, like the accessibility policy, um, things of that nature. So we helped them by developing that template. So it gave them a lot of freedom, but they were meeting 17 individual standards if they adopted that template without editing anything else. If they edited everything in the template that was read, then they met quite a few additional standards. So something like that really goes a long way because when you say, oh, if you use this, you've already met 17 standard, individual standards, they're thinking, wow, out of 43, I've met 17. So they were very pleased. <laughs> um, we also developed, we called it a QM showcase in Blackboard, where we touched on every single standard and individual standard and developed examples. A lot of faculty, uh, if they're developing on their own, all they want to see is an example. Uh, if they have an idea of what you're expecting, then they'll go with it. Um, so that's been very successful as well. We've had um, over, uh, it's self-enroll in our Blackboard system. And we've had a um, little over 1,500 faculty utilize it. We also implemented, we called them work sessions. Um, and we did it, uh, first started with departments, individual departments, reserved a lab, and allowed faculty to schedule a one-hour time block with um, someone that's certified as a peer reviewer. It could be our instructional designers. It might be a faculty member in the department um, that has went through the peer review uh, quality matters training. But that faculty member was allowed to um, schedule that one hour. I paired them up with an individual. 
uh, whoever they were paired with as their mentor reviewed the course prior to the work session. So when the individuals met in the computer lab, uh, that mentor would go over and say, here are some missing components, or uh, let me help you with this. And then the mentor continues to um, contact the faculty member on a regular basis. We do it every two weeks uh, and kind of set goals. Um, let's work on standard one first. Um, and then two weeks later, we'll review it. If it's good to go, then move on to standard two. But the mentor um, has really been successful by keep, to keep the faculty on track. So those are some of the key areas that um, work for us in the implementation. Um, and I can't say that I created all of those myself because I went to several Quality Matters conferences and listened to what was working for other colleges. Do you think that uh, the faculty buy-in overall um, has been, you know, you, you kind of targeted first uh, kind of the, the leaders or the, the ones that really were ahead of the curve by offering them an incentive. Um, do you think that uh, the feedback that you received after they went through uh, creating the course or working with a mentor, um, that it kind of provided a further incentive for others because it helped that faculty member to just have a, a better course for students? Um, it did. Uh, word started getting out about how easy it was uh, because, of course, anytime you implement something, they talk about all the work that's going to, the hours it's going to take, yeah. the hard work. Um, but once our early adopters started talking um, about being assigned a mentor and how easy it was, um, that it went quicker than they had thought, things of that nature. Um, we started really getting a lot of requests. We didn't have a lot when we first started these work sessions. And then our smaller departments where we were getting a lot of requests, we started um, doing uh, college-wide where uh, we would get the, like the history, the political science, the English, because we didn't have um, a lot of online courses in one department. So we opened up a bigger lab and invited um, all a variety of departments into it. And that was very successful because after they went through the, the mentor program, um, word really started to spread. Mm. So yes, it's been very successful. But as you know, um, in any implementation, you're going to have a couple of departments or programs that are resistant. <laughs> and I have had um, two programs that um, have been very difficult to work with, and so we're trying to come up with some other ways that we can better serve them. Mm. Uh, what, what, what do you think are the particular hurdles for those departments to join or buy into, this, into the current process? Uh, honestly, um, it's going to take them more work because the this program, um, there's no structure, and they don't have any content in our learning management system. They have done everything through Blackboard Collaborate um, because they don't want to take time to develop content. So they feel that um, we refer to it as a talking head because there's no structure. It's just we're going to be online at 6 o'clock on X night. Uh, so that's the group that's having the toughest time because they don't really um, – foresee the need for structure. Okay, yeah. Um, we, we are facing a, a similar issue at uh, UF with some departments as well in that regard. Although we don't have a university-wide policy yet or in regards to quality standards. Um, but I see the, the same kind of uh, reluctance uh, from a few faculty members and even some departments because what they see up front is, oh, we have to do this additional work in order to even, you know, be in the realm of, uh, of uh, meeting some of these standards or even being considered for meeting some of these standards. And that seems to be the, the biggest hurdle for them to just uh, ask potentially for help or see the benefits of um, going through this process of quality implementation in their courses. Something else that we did that I brought up to our um, programs that are resistant, um, we did, um, did some data collection. Mm. Of, offered the same course, used one that had met the standards and the other that was um, a previous um, 
Blackboard Shell and evaluated the student evaluation of instruction. And there was a huge difference in the evaluations. So when we shared that data, I thought that might help our programs that, re that uh, were resistant, and it didn't phase them. Hmm. Uh, yeah, well, there comes a point where you probably have to come down with a hammer and say, okay, if you want to teach online, you have to meet these standards. And that's what we are um, planning to do with our new dean coming in. Actually, I had that conversation with him today. We just need to set a deadline of your course has to meet standards by X date or it can't be offered. So we're looking um, tentatively, This again, this was just a brief conversation, but December of 2017, that's going to give them a year and a half to get their courses ready. Oh, yeah. That, that should be plenty hey, of I have a question. <laughs> sure, go ahead. A question. Yeah, in terms of the budget, uh, you know, the faculty, they, they put a lot of time on, on creating and developing a course. And in terms of the budget, who, how are you going to support them on budgetary? With our programs, everything that is offered online, um, revenue is returned to the department, and they're supposed to reinvest that revenue. Um, so that's been how uh, departments have paid for the development. Uh, now, we have covered, out of my office, we've covered all training costs. Um, so we haven't put any of that um, out on departments. We've covered all of that. We've purchased the workbooks for them. It's just that they the departments pay the stipend for um, modifying their course. That, that's, that's very expensive. Um, it can be. Not all um, departments have paid money. They've given a release because they don't have the revenue. Um, they'll give a, a release for the faculty to develop it. Um, some have said, this is part of your job. This is your course. It should meet standards. Um, so we expect you to, to work on your course to meet standards. And again, the mentor does a lot of the hands-on work for them. It's the faculty providing the, the content, the revisions, things of that nature. But the mentor, um, a lot of our mentors are instructional designers. And they do the actual hands-on work. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think to some degree, you need to have a, an infrastructure already in place in order to support faculty who want to engage in this process uh, and who are eager to receive help. Because um, as, as, uh, as Cindy has said, and as I have seen as well in our college and in, in some other colleges at UF, uh, once you have a critical mass of faculty that are buying into it and see the benefits of going through this process, um, because in the end you will have it a lot easier when you meet these standards uh, to serve your students and to actually go through the review process through this implementation cycle, review and design cycle, uh, because you, you have a very well-structured course. And that kind of sets you up in a, in a much better position and actually saves you time and money down the road. Um, that's absolutely correct, Oliver, and I can't tell you how many of the faculty um, who have worked with us uh, come back and say, um, "You've made for a better. Uh, you've made me a better instructor, and my course is so much better." And they haven't only applied the QM standards to their online; they're telling me that they're uh, implementing some of this in their face-to-face -face as well. Mm. That, that makes sense because some of them yeah. can be directly translated into the face-to-face -face, even if you do like a blended answer some portion is is in the uh, learning management system but also in you know keeping students engaged throughout the course and not only giving a lecture another area that um, I'm being told they're incorporating in their face-to-face -face, they really never thought about alignment mm -hmm. and I think we all have experienced that as students as well it's um, you're doing these activities or these assessments, but it really doesn't align with the objectives. So a lot of faculty have really taken a closer look at that and have redone their assignments and assessments to align. And that can be challenging at first because you really have to look critically at your own work that you have been doing uh, when you initially designed the course, if it's an older course that you have been teaching before. And uh, for the QM rubrics, uh, what's important to note is that 
uh, they will only do the review if the course has been taught, I think, at least once or twice before, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, we recommend that it's taught twice before it goes through the review process. Hmm. Yeah. I think we have one more. Okay. Yeah, this is what's the best practices that you have established at uh, West Virginia. You want to talk about this a little bit, Cindy? Yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the teamwork, um, how this has really helped us to move the quality matters along. Um, we do brown bag luncheons. Um, as you know, faculty like to hear from faculty. They don't want an instructional designer telling them what they need to do or an administrator. They want faculty to talk about, um, honestly, successes and failures. So we did brown bag luncheons where faculty were able to talk about their accomplishments, um, their frustrations, because some were very frustrated uh, with the revision and then the resources they utilize to, to make their revisions. Uh, we also had faculty roundtables of our early buy-in, our early adopters, and the faculty would come together with the chair of the review committee and discuss the feedback from their QM review. And then um, an example was uh, our business school, they were early adopters, but faculty were open to other faculty coming into that review, so it, the re discussion of the review. So it helped other faculty, even though it wasn't their course, it helped them to get a better understanding of what needed to be incorporated. So we really received way, um, very positive feedback about the um, review sessions. Um, I mentioned the template in the QM showcase. They've been very successful with helping to meet this. And then communication. It can't be just periodic communication. It has to be frequent communication about quality matters. Um, how can we help you? Do you want a work session? Uh, I felt like I was really bugging uh, departments when we first started this, or faculty, and we weren't getting anywhere. So then I started sending out um, frequent communication, whether it be a newsletter, inviting them to brown bag luncheons. Um, we even started um, a success story for every, I did every two weeks for the courses that would pass or the, um, even the courses that would come up for review. I would uh, incorporate that into um, an HTML message that I would send out to the faculty listserv. It was kind of praising the faculty, and that went a long way as well. Talked about the work sessions already. Um, feedback was critical, uh, not only to us, because when we started this, um, we had to try a couple different um, things to make it work. Uh, so try to have your everything in place if you're going to implement this. We didn't have enough resources when we implemented it, uh, and that we recognized that right off the bat. As soon as we started, um, we realized because there was a backlog of reviews, and that was some of the really negative feedback that we received is, why is it taking so long? I didn't have enough peer reviewers at that time, but right now I'm up to 67 reviewers, so they're going much quicker. Um, but feedback's important, whether it's positive or negative. And then from our feedback, we... Um, revamped our common problems. The review was a, an issue. We needed the template. So um, revamping our uh, problems really helped to solve problems in the long run. But again, teamwork's critical when implementing anything, but especially when you're uh, talking about incorporating standards in courses. I think within uh, the last I don't know, maybe the last seven, eight years we've come a very long way in regards to recognizing the importance of instructional designers, that it's not only the um, instructor or the professor who is uh, teaching as a single person. Um, and obviously, since we're moving away from kind of just the lecture style uh, format, uh, we, we really have to realize and recognize that it is a teamwork effort. And I see that in, in the way I'm teaching now. In, the, in our PharmD curriculum at the College of Pharmacy at the University of Florida. We have been shifting, we have been revamping the whole curriculum, and with it we have been really trying to uh, make it more active because it's still a, an on-campus program, it's not an online program. Uh, and a lot of the lectures have now been shifted to shorter lectures uh, that focus on particular areas and preparing students for active learning sessions. And in that setting, the quality 
uh, and delivery of that content in, in a good and organized manner is crucial to the success of students and to the success of the active learning sessions that we have been setting up. So it really goes hand in hand, not only as Cindy already pointed out uh, for the online uh, classroom, but also for the face-to-face -face classroom. Uh, this has huge implications and benefits. Okay, um, are there any questions? It is clear. Okay, uh, so Faridun, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your institution. Uh, have you been considering implementing online or are you working online with, uh, with your institution? Yes, uh, actually uh, I have my own institution which is uh, the name is Barkhat. Uh, institution is almost uh, last year uh, this institution established you know in Iran uh, almost uh, uh, most of the universities is run by government mm -hmm. and uh, actually the online uh, teaching is almost uh, start uh, 10 years ago in uh, Iran and due to the problem with the uh, bandwidth, uh, internet, technology, and uh, so on, so uh, this kind of uh, education is goes a uh, little bit slow. And at present time, almost 26 uh, university, gover uh, which is run by government, they have uh, some kind of uh, online uh, uh, t online uh, program. Uh, but uh, online program in this university is not uh, covered by all departments. It is a few major like uh, information technology mm -hmm. and some other uh, course, uh, 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 some other field which is uh, uh, maybe is useful for online uh, education. Uh, goes well in this uh, 26 uh, uh, university but also uh, since a few years ago uh, almost four university four in institution are uh, in private and uh, three of them in Tehran and uh, uh, mine which is the Barkhat University is in uh, out of Tehran you know uh, my university is, uh, is, is online and uh, is private, but we have started with two major. One is in information technology in the field of the computer networking and uh, another one in e-commerce, both in master degree. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the courses, developing a courses, mm -hmm. Uh, yes, there is a few uh, company they developing a course uh, in very expensive uh, manner and what is very expensive and so it is very difficult to uh, do all the developing these courses by faculty because the institution has to pay them uh, and that will cost you a lot. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, uh, I think uh, I think the online courses, uh, developing online courses right now, uh, is uh, too early. Another problem uh, with uh, our uh, uh, online courses and online universities is uh, the not good. Uh, as I said, uh, LMS or CMS, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever we have right now, we develop it by open sources. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, uh, for example, right now in USA, we have a Blackboard. Blackboard almost is a uh, uh, very good uh, LMS and CMS. And uh, all university they can buy this license and they can, you know, use it. And developing the courses on Blackboard. I, I am familiar with that because I've been in USA before. 
-hmm. but uh, we don't have that accessibility on uh, some kind of software like Blackboard. So online courses in terms of the technology in Iran goes slow. And if we want to buy all these f facilities uh, like Blackboard, it costs a lot. Therefore, uh, we just uh, right now thinking, uh, you know, offering few course, go uh, slowly. And uh, basically, what we do, basically, we talk to the professors, the faculties, and they teach online. Instead of uh, developing a course, we ask them uh, uh, and we set up some times for them and they come online, a student, they come online. And uh, like, like uh, the online uh, campus courses. Uh, but uh, they teach online for students and we put some of the sources like PDFs, PowerPoints and uh, books and sometimes you know uh, maybe some other materials in order to cover uh, some of the uh, resources, references for a student. So uh, many difficulties right now but I, but I think uh, it's going to be a good future. That's interesting to hear because, I mean, uh, it's not that overnight all of a sudden here in the U.S. Yeah. or in other countries we were where we are now. It also took a very long process of getting where we are now. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe in the last 15 years or so we've seen really learning management systems and the like really take off on a larger scale. Um, and before that, it was it was still very much limited. And obviously, there's an issue in uh, in terms of reputation that has been uh, kind of, I think, holding back many of the major institutions uh, from really getting into online education. Uh, at least from you know what I can tell when I uh, came to the states. I myself from Germany. Uh, when I came to the states. Um, there wasn't in 2005 or 2004 there wasn't nearly as much as many opportunities available online as there are now and I think that's because uh, now we have actually a system in place uh, that kind of kind of um, is more um, widely accepted uh, and uh, kind of facilitates uh, and, and kind of makes also the, the online environment competitive because there are major players now, major institutions that are moving into the online space. Cindy, um, when, when did uh, West Virginia start really to go full-blown online with, with you know, like 500 courses now? We started about 10 years ago, but we started yeah. with one program, it was special education. Yeah. Um, and then we've just built. But again, with the online, we had to get early adopters. Um, it was special education, then integrated marketing communication, and then the MBA uh, were our first three programs. And we had to show that they were a success before others bought into it. Yeah. Well, what, what also is, is the case for many of the online programs is that they need to be pretty much self-sustainable. Uh, so without potentially uh, any... Uh, funding from the state. At least that's how it how it is for our college. That they all considered off book programs, so they don't get any state funding, um, and therefore we kind of need to be uh, conscious about uh, our resources that we have to uh, to to make these these courses and these programs feasible. Um, Cindy, did you have? Uh, is it is it also the case at at, at uh, West Virginia for these courses? Um, it is. When we first started online, uh, we did uh, grants. Uh, we did an RFP, mm. and then we paid development money for faculty to develop the online. That was like seed money to get started. And then they had to reinvest because we didn't pay for the whole 30, um, 6, 39 hours. So once they started generating revenue, they would reinvest that with uh, the course development. Yeah. Um, but yeah, our programs have to be self-supporting. Uh, sometimes there's seed money from the college or our office. Uh, but something else to keep in mind is it's not only um, the development and the teaching, there's re uh, support resources that need to be available for students. 
uh, because a lot of, with online programs, you have a lot of adult learners, and they're not real tech savvy, so they need additional support. And often after hours support, so you have you almost need to have a 24-7 uh, support system in place. You're, uh, you're Cindy, correct. Cindy, yeah. I have a question. This okay. courses, uh, this courses is a, uh, in what, what, what major is it? Is it different major? What, what uh, field are? Um, yeah, we have actually 29 degrees. Okay. Uh, so it's across, a majority of ours are graduate level. Uh, like I said, special education, master's of business administration, uh, higher education, uh, it's an educational leadership, but it's called higher education administration. Um, we have secondary education, uh, uh, just a, a wide variety. And then our undergraduates, we have two like general studies degrees and a child development degree. And this course is uh, uh, open for all public or no, just for students? Um, we do have, we call it a guest pass, where uh, people outside can come in and take up to 12 credit hours. Um, but majority of ours are targeted directly at our um, students who are admitted to programs. And this, uh, this courses is, can be shared by other universities? Um, no, students would have to register at WVU. We don't um, share our content. It's not like MIT, they have open university courses. You know, is 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 a public for everybody. Like everybody can no, use it. No, our faculty um, take that ownership. It's their content, so well, they don't want to put it out there. So it's the ownership by them. That's why. Yes. And, and how, how faculty they they get benefit of it? Is they just have some kind of, of uh, money they get back for that? Um. You know, it varies, again, uh, according to the program. Some programs, uh, faculty teach as overload, so they're paid. Um, some will teach that as um, the, uh, their current workload. So it does vary. And another area that it really helps, um, the faculty would develop these courses, and then when they retire and relocate, like right now I have a faculty member in Florida, Colorado, Texas. They taught when they were here on campus, but now they're also uh, continuing to teach at a distance. Any any consortium on uh, uh, you know you 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 have a any consortium which is they can share some kind of uh, courses with other university? Do do you uh, member of the, some kind of consortium? Um, we're not. We have done some partnerships with other institutions where um, it's shared. It might be a degree where one institution uh, does X number of courses and then we do X number of courses. And then we share that, um, but we're not. Um, I mean, it's not through a consortium. Uh, any way we can just see a sample of the courses you developed? Is that possible? I don't have a way to show that because with our learning management system, you have to have a uh, have to have login credentials, and so you have to be uh, associated with WBU in order to access our showcase. Uh. So it's not possible then? Uh, yeah, I don't have any way to put it out there. OK. Let me, as, Oliver, a, as, a, as a guest, Oliver, I can look at them. I'm sorry? Well, as well, a guest. Um, uh, sorry to interrupt there, Faridun, but we, we, we're out of time. So um, I think the, the issue here is uh, that this is basically a copyrighted material that many of the institutions and UF itself, our institution like West Virginia or Pennsylvania or anybody else, uh, kind of they keep their content as their own copyright mm -hmm. and therefore you need to either log in uh, as if you are a member of the, of the college or of the university, so you pay for the course. Uh, that's how we do it at UF as well. So you basically become a student in that program or you become a what we, what we say is a non-degree seeking student who's only taking one course for their own professional development, for example. If they're really interested in a particular topic, then they can take that without having to be a full-time student. So this is kind of how, how this concept works at the moment. And that is obviously the same way as if you would sit in a, in a classroom. Uh, there are also the materials that you provided are basically only for the purposes of you being the student in that class. That's kind of... Okay. 
uh, how how the current uh, concept works for most. What you probably think about is like uh, the MOOCs, uh, the uh, really massive online um, open mm -hmm. open online courses that are being offered by some institutions for free. Um, most of the MOOCs are uh, potentially intended to draw students into the institutions, which is completely legitimate. Um, mm -hmm. And but. A MOOC will not provide you with a course, uh, with a, a path necessarily to uh, to finishing a, or receiving a degree. There are now some credentials that are being considered for MOOCs, but uh, I don't think that MOOCs are going to be the future of online or distance education. Thank you. Okay. Um, Cindy, do you have any further comments? I don't. Okay. Uh, Tony, you joined us a little bit later. I apologize. We are at the end of uh, this webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Cindy, for taking the time uh, to uh, to speak today um, and share your experiences and insights at West Virginia. Uh, thank you for every uh, to everybody who was able to attend today. It was a very interesting discussion, mm -hmm. and I think a very relevant discussion for nearly all of. Uh, the colleges or institutions that uh, want to or are, uh, or are already working online. Uh, quick reminder, uh, the um, uh, ADEC at Future Conference uh, uh, that happens this year at um, the University of Los Angeles, uh, usually uh, University of California in Los Angeles will take place September 22nd, 23rd. The early bird registration has been extended uh, to the end of the month. Um, you should have received um, uh, an invitation uh, a couple of days ago, also with a call for abstracts that has been extended for a few days. Uh, so if you haven't registered yet, I encourage you to register for the ADEC at Future Conference. It's a great way to network and uh, meet each other. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Cindy, and have a good evening thank coming you. up. Have a good thank evening. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.